For the next several weeks, we will be preaching from passages that are not customarily found in the lectionary at this particular moment in time. Sometimes hearing God's word at unexpected moments can enable us to see and hear and learn with a fresh insight. And so this morning we will hear from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 35 to 41. Listen to God's word. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion, and they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come today to worship <clears throat> because you are God and because we long to hear your voice. Calm any troubled waters in our hearts and in our lives. Set aside anything that distracts us from drawing near to you. Nurture our faith by your grace that we might serve you with wholeness of heart, mind, soul, and strength. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I shared in our earlier service that this is a text from which I could preach many sermons. If I could have a couple of weeks and a laptop and a cabin in the woods and a bunch of commentaries, I could crank out quite a few sermons. But I don't think I could get away from the church or my family. And um, so this is the one that's here today. And so I'd like to start by suggesting this. Following is an art. Following is an art. It is underrated, but following takes exceptional skill and attention. And perhaps above all, following takes trust. Following is harder than people imagine, and often people are left to figure out how to make following happen on their own. It's not a skill we are taught with great awareness, but anyone who has taken a group exercise class or flown a commercial aircraft or played an instrument in a marching band or participated as a part of a surgical team in an operating room, following is an art and it requires mastery in order for any of us to reach our desired goal, especially when our goal is one we share with others. Following, following well, helps avert disaster. Now, as we recall the words to this familiar passage for today, if you're anything like me, and I'm not saying you are, but hypothetically, your mind might jump to the almost end of the story. Now, it's easy to focus 
so clearly on the one who is the leader of this motley crew at sea, even if he is asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. The almost end of the story is the satisfying part of the story. It's the part that offers us all some hope and relief when we are experiencing pressures and tensions then feel like life just might be a little overwhelming. Jesus calms the storm. With the utterance of a simple phrase, Jesus settles the winds and the waves that threaten the lives of those on the boat at sea. And in these few verses, we too find assurance that here and now we worship a God who in Christ has the power to command the forces of our lives that might cause a ruckus or create difficulty or even threaten harm. God is stronger than the powers of the world that seem so out of control. And the situations in our world that are clearly out of our control. Jesus reminds us in this passage that God is stronger than the powers that might harm. And so we can exhale, sermon over, we can settle down. God is with us. God calms the storms, puts out fires, and is the source of peace. And these verses do assure us that this is true that here and now we worship a God who has the power to calm us and calm storms and command nature. And it gives us hope, especially when we're in seasons of our lives that are filled with struggle or uncertainty. When life feels out of control, it is comforting to be reminded that God is God and we are not. And that what's more is we worship a God whose power is stronger than the forces of this world that threaten to destroy us. God's power heals and calms and forgives and restores and gives life and loves. But see, our understanding of God and even of ourselves is limited if we just focus on this part of the story. Because honestly, if we look at the whole text, we might notice that even though Jesus responds to the terrified cries of the disciples, Jesus is actually not particularly concerned about the storm. Jesus did not bring his disciples onto the waters to show the breadth of his power or to challenge their fears. He did not create a therapeutic environment on this rocky boat to help the disciples overcome doubts or phobias or even prove to them that he is one who could be trusted. Honestly, the storm does not seem to matter all that much to Jesus. It is of such little significance to him that even on a ship that is being tossed around by waves and wind, Jesus takes a nap. It is what it is. Storms happen. Life goes on and Jesus goes to sleep. And he keeps on sleeping until the disciples shake him awake in terror. What Jesus seems to find most interesting is getting to the other side. Jesus, Jesus' agenda in this text is about getting to the other side of the sea and getting ready to do what comes next. Let's get in the boat and go to the other side, Jesus says at the start of this story. Let's go. Let's go somewhere new. Let's wrap up this visit with the folks with whom we've been talking and teaching all day, and let's go. Let's do something together we haven't done before. Let's befriend enemies. Let's pay attention to people we have been taught to ignore. Let's go and explore a region 
that is a place we have been brought up to think was off limits, unworthy, and maybe even dangerous. Let's get moving. Come on. There's more to do. Will you join me? One commentator points out that this is Jesus' first foray in Mark into what might be considered a dangerous or even inappropriate destination. Thus, Jesus' venture into such a foreign region across the sea is a deliberate demonstration of his claim that his mission extends beyond the Jews. That by carrying his ministry into Gentile territory, Jesus reaches out to the strangers, the others, even the enemies. The gospel Jesus proclaims and demonstrates represents good news for all, transcending the human characteristics we use to separate ourselves from others. Let's go. Let's go to the other side. And not only let's go, but let's go together. Once more, Jesus invites his disciples to follow. And following is not just about sitting on a hillside, listening to stories about sowers and seeds. You can hear that story earlier in the fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel. And it's not just about miracles and unexpected demonstrations of the power of God's love. You can read that in chapter 5. But following is about trusting that God will get you where you need to go. And as the story clearly shows us, we already know it to be true, because it doesn't appear that the journey together is actually going to be easy or even entirely safe. In fact, the let's go will often take us to unfamiliar places and difficult routes. Sometimes the travel itinerary comes with more unexpected twists and turns than we could easily navigate on our own. Sometimes the destination is one that makes us squirm. But the good news of the story is that the one who invites us to get into the boat travels with us always. God is with us. Even when God is calling us to rocky waters, we do not ever face those waters alone. Jesus is with us even if he is asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. But let's face it, much like the disciples, our faith is not always ready for the winds and the waves. There are many times in our lives when it feels like we are out there perishing, about to go under with the next wave. Even if we believe that Jesus is with us, we are convinced that if he is sound asleep, we are going to drown under the weight of the waves. And so we cry out too, Jesus, don't you care about us? Our head pastor left months ago, and we are still waiting to call an interim. Jesus, don't you care about us? We do not know what's coming next, and we're not quite sure what just happened. What are we to believe? Jesus, don't you care? The market is tanking. There is an election coming up, and things are scary. COVID is not really over, but I have to go on and act like it is. Where are you, Jesus? Come on. Don't you care? We can't get there without you. And then Jesus wakes up. He rubs his eyes. He's like, I'm here. I'm here. I've been here the whole time. This invitation to discipleship, to following Jesus, it's hard. It is even scary. Jesus continually asks us over and over and over again to trust where the circumstances all around us 
make us question if God can really be trusted. Jesus invites us to follow, but has the nerve to take us somewhere that is way past the clear lines of our comfort zones, our skill sets, and even our awareness of what is possible. But we are invited into the artistry of discipleship, following. To follow Jesus because we trust in who Jesus is even when we don't trust the world around us. To trust that in Jesus the fullness of God's love dwells even if we don't trust our own capacity to love well. And to trust that even if the journey is not easy, we will get where we are going. As another commentator puts it, the promise of this text is also that there is something on the other side that Jesus knows about. And Jesus needs to get us there. Of course, the reality for the disciples and for us is that the other side is not always that rosy. It has its own set of challenges. The disciples have to see Jesus differently, to see themselves differently. It means living into a new reality, and that takes getting used to. But this commentator goes on to say, Perhaps the act of faith is not just the trust that Jesus will still the storm. The act of faith is taking Jesus' invitation to heart. The act of faith is getting into the boat. The act of faith is believing that another side is not only possible, it is essential. So siblings, let's get into the boat. Let's believe that another side is not only possible, but essential. Let us hear the assurance that Jesus is the captain of our destinies even if the voyage takes us through choppy waters. And let us have hope that we will get to the place to which God is indeed calling us in faith. That our gifts and our hopes and our insights, our curiosities and our love will indeed be blessed by God and used for God's loving purpose. Let's get in the boat. Let's put our hope in a God whose presence we can feel lifting us in our times of distress or fear or grief or exhaustion. Let's get in the boat and let's reach out our hand and help someone else to get in the boat because it is a lot easier to get into a boat with help from someone else. And then when we are in this boat, let us remember, God is with us, always. Thanks be to God. Amen.